Hello everyone. Welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com. This is the part 8 of hemolytic anemia series and in this part I'll be discussing about immune hemolytic anemia. This topic will be discussed under these various headings. Now let's get back to the classification of hemolytic anemias. In the previous part we have discussed all these hereditary hemolytic anemias and PNH which is which is an acquired hemolytic anemia, okay? In this part I shall be talking about immune hemolytic anemias. Now what is this immune hemolytic anemia? It is anemia which is caused by antibodies that recognize the red cells and lead to their premature destruction. Immune because it is caused by antibodies, hemolytic because there is premature destruction of RBCs resulting in anemias. So hence these are immune hemolytic anemias. Now how do you classify immune hemolytic anemias? They are classified based on the characteristics of the responsible antibody. Okay, They can be you know warm antibody or in broad cold antibodies. Warm antibody type they are IgG antibodies which are active at 37 degrees centigrade and cold antibodies can be of cold agglutinin type which are IgM and cold hemolysin type which are IgG antibodies. Now let us understand the differences between these two types of antibodies, warm and cold active antibodies. Warm antibodies, they have the greatest affinity for RBCs at 37 degrees centigrade, whereas cold active antibodies, they have very little activity at body temperature, but then they have affinity, greater affinity as the temperature decreases from 37 degrees centigrade towards zero degree centigrade. The warm antibodies are typically IgG, whereas cold antibodies are typically IgM type. The mechanism of destruction of RBCs is basically by complements, you know, they fix complements. The IgM antibodies fix complement and that leads to immediate intravascular RBC lysis or hepatic mediated clearance. We will discuss this uh, in detail a bit later. Whereas warm active antibodies may or may not fix the complement but then the loss of RBCs is basically by splenic mediated clearance of these sensitized red blood cells. Now let us understand pathogenesis of or mechanism of hemolysis by warm and cold active antibodies. Now firstly mechanism of hemolysis by warm active antibodies. There are two different mechanisms. The first mechanism is you know let us consider that this is an RBC and that's a IgG antibody and we have macrophages which have FC receptor for this particular antibody. Hmm. Once there is antigen and anti antibody there is binding of immunoglobulin G to the FC receptor and once that binding happens the macrophage there is a conformational change on the surface of macrophage they throw pseudopods and then the RBC is engulfed the entire RBC is phagocytosed and that's why this is referred to as complete phagocytosis the entire RBC is phagocytosed. This is the mechanism number one. Now in contrast, the second mechanism, same RBC and antibodies, you know, there is attachment of antibody to the receptor and the macrophage inst instead of you know engulfing the entire RBC, what it does is it basically the portion of the membrane attached to the antibody is removed. Okay, the macrophage just bites that part of the RBC where antibody is attached. So what does that happen? That, that result in you know loss of RBC membrane and this process is referred to as partial phagocytosis in contrast to the complete phagocytosis which we discussed in mechanism number one right. So this is partial phagocytosis more loss of membrane and subsequently because of loss of membrane the RBCs are now transformed into spirocytes and now you, and you know what really happens to spirocytes right spirocytes they are sequestered in the splenic red pulp and then they are phagocytosed by the macrophages in the splenic cards so these are the two mechanisms where i mean these are the two mechanisms where hemolysis occurs due to warm active antibodies so that's the summary of the mechanisms of hemolysis by warm active antibodies now having understood the mechanism, we need to know that, you know, whenever the amount of antibodies are too much, you know, the larger amount of antibodies on the surface of RBCs and that leads to sequestration in the liver. In contrast, if the number of antibodies are small, 
if there is small amount of antibodies in the RBCs and that lead to splenic sequestration. So that's the reason. You know that in the spleen there are lots and lots of macrophages and that's why there will be more phagocytosis of RBCs in the spleen. And this is the reason why splenectomy, you know, in these patients reduces the pathology in most of the immune hemolytic anemias particularly the warm antibody type of hemolytic anemia. Now, moving on to understanding the mechanism of hemolysis by cold active antibodies. Okay. Now, this is mediated by complement system, either directly or indirectly, directly by means of cytolysis. Now, what does that mean? That means the hemolysis here is by generating the cytolytic membrane attack complex. You should be aware that C5 to C9 is referred to as membrane attack complex. And once this membrane attack complex goes on to the RBC surface, there will be formation of multiple pores on the RBC membrane leading to cytolysis. This is the direct mechanism by means of complement. Now, what is this indirect mechanism? Indirect mechanism is basically by RBC bound C3 fragments with the receptors on the reticuloendothelial cells in the liver. See, that's an RBC. You have a C3 fragment, particularly C3B, and you have a macrophage in liver. They are copper cells, right? So you have a receptor for this C3B fragment. So there is a receptor ligand interaction leading to phagocytosis. So this is indirect way of hemolysis, which are mediated by complement system. Right. So we now understood the mechanisms of hemolysis in both warm antibody type as well as cold antibody type. Right. Now let us understand in detail about the warm antibody type of immune hemolytic anemia. These are the ones which constitutes approximately 80 percent of cases. Most often they are primary. That means idiopathic. You don't have any cause. Secondary causes include various autoimmune disorders, particularly systemic lupus erythematosus. Even drugs are implicated in warm antibody hemolytic anemia and other and some lymphoid neoplasms. So as you know, most of the causative antibodies are of IgG class, right? Less commonly IgA class. Just a simple way of remembering warm antibody type, you know, which are IgG and IgA, warm hearted person who are often generous and affectionate, right? Hope you remember the type of antibody this way. Anyway, the clinical features of warm antibody type of immune hemolytic anemia are most often they are insidious in onset. They often present with weakness, dizziness, fatigue and dyspnea on exertion, often have waxing and waning course. The findings include splenomegaly, hepatomegaly and lymphadenopathy. But at this point, you need to remember that the autoantibody formation is more common in pregnancy. The pregnant women are more prone to develop warm antibody type of immune hemolytic anemias. Okay. Now, the laboratory findings in warm antibody type of IHA includes the hemoglobin can be either normal or low. MCV is increased. That means to say that they indicate increased number of relatively young RBCs. Okay. And also that because of relative folate deficiency due to chronic hemolysis. So remember, hemoglobin is low. MCV is increased. The reticulocyte count is increased. Sometimes it can be reduced as well. WBC and platelets are decreased. But what is important to note that direct antiglobulin test is always positive. The peripheral smear findings include, you know, they have increased polychromatophilic cells. That's why, you know, the RBC, the MCV is increased, right? So they can be macrocytes, they can be nucleated RBCs. Spirocytes, they can be seen in varying quantity. You know the cause of spirocytes, right? That's because of loss of membrane in the process of partial phagocytosis. Erythrophagocytosis. If you see a, you know, an RBC engulfed by or an RBC inside a monocyte or a neutrophil, Remember, you are dealing with the case of immune hemolytic anemia. Okay, erythrophagocytosis should not be seen. Erythrophagocytosis means there is some amount of antibody on the RBCs and that's devoured by the neutrophils and monocytes. So that is always an indication of immune hemolytic anemia. Now moving on to immune hemolytic anemia caused by cold active antibodies. There are two types as I told you. One is cold agglutinin type which are typically IgM. Another is cold hemolysin type which are IgG. Both are active below 37 degrees centigrade. Now what is this cold agglutinin type? The most causative antibodies here are IgM class. Often, you know, they can be primary or secondary, but the secondary causes includes infections and non-infectious causes. 
Remember, the infections include mycoplasma, mononucleosis, that is infectious mononucleosis, mumps and malaria. So remember all M's. And non-infectious include Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, squamous cell carcinoma of lung, metastasis from adrenal adenocarcinoma and colon carcinoma, can be sometimes basal cell carcinoma or even mixed parotid tumor. You see there are lots of M's, you know, IgM, remember this way, cold agglutinin disease, IgM and mycopla all these M diseases, mycoplasma, mononucleosis, mumps and malaria, right? So these are the secondary uh, causes of hemolytic anemia due to cold agglutinin antibodies. Now the pathogenesis we all know now because of these cold antibodies which attaches to the RBCs in the cooler peripheral circulation. We know that the peripheral circulation is always cooler as compared to the warmer core circulation in the center, right? So in the warmer core circulation, the antibodies are dissociated. They are attached only in the cooler peripheral circulation. Okay, now what do they do? We know that they fix complement which leads to immediate intravascular RBC lysis or hepatic mediated clearance. It can be the direct or indirect way of hemolysis as we discussed earlier, right? The clinical features of cold antibody a type of immunohemolytic anemia they have mild chronic hemolytic anemia which exacerbates in winter season you know they have acrocyanosis which means you know there is bluish discoloration of the extremities as you can see here in the cooler vessels of the hands ears nose and feet okay the digits may become cold stiff painful or numb and then turn purplish now the laboratory findings include low hemoglobin there is a clue while you do, uh, you know, complete blood count in an analyzer. The RBC count can be artifactually low. MCV can be artifactually high. You know, that results in spuriously high MCHC. All these things happen. You know, you don't, you can't get a valid RBC count because, because of clumping due to antibodies. Okay, there is a, many of these RBCs clump together. Many of these RBCs with antibodies clump together. And that's why RBC count can be artifactually low. There is a modest increase in reticulocyte count. Bilirubin can be mildly elevated. Again, direct antiglobulin test is positive. Peripheral smear findings are very typical, you know. Uh, before you actually prepare a peripheral smear, the temperature is very severe or severely cold, you know. It is very difficult to prepare an ideal smear. That's because of gross clumping. Sometimes if severe, the blood in the tube appears as clot and that is because of agglutination. Remember, we are dealing with an anticoagulated blood. Even in anticoagulated blood, if the blood appears like a clot, think that you are dealing with a cold antibody type of hemolytic anemia. Okay, now if the smears can be prepared, you can observe these large clumps, you know, the clumps of RBCs in the low magnification itself. Okay, that's a very characteristic feature of immune hemolytic anemia of cold antibody type. The third one is cold hemolysin type. That's a second type of cold uh, antibody. Cold hemolysin type. These are also referred to as Donath Landsteiner antibody. We all know who is Landsteiner, right? Father of modern blood banking. So Donath Landsteiner antibodies, these are the antibodies which bind to RBCs at lower temperature in the periphery. Okay, because peripherally they are cooler and fixed complement in the peripheral circulation. But then when they return to the warm central core, the antibodies are not dissociated. The antibody associated RBCs are destroyed by complement mediated hemolysis. And these are IgG antibodies, just like the warm antibodies, right? Now these antibodies characteristically bind to the P blood group antigen and this P blood group antigen is basically a glycospingolipid globocyte which are found on the RBC membranes. Now clinical features include most of these cases are often found in children that too these children will always have a history of viral infection. After viral infection, after some days, you know, these patients, these children, you know, they manifest with sudden onset of fever, back pain or leg pain or hemoglobinuria after exposure to cold. Remember, this, these patients have history of viral infections. Now, the symptoms may occur shortly or few hours later after exposure to the cold. And these are often transient. They are self-limiting and non-recurring. But remember, sometimes, very rarely, it can be severe, life-threatening without supportive care. So that's all about immune hemolytic anemias.
we talked about different types of immune hemolytic anemias particularly the warm antibody type and the cold antibody type we discussed the pathogenesis of immune hemolytic anemias the clinical features of these two major types relevant lab findings yes we didn't discuss about the treatment most often the treatment include the supportive line of management supportive care so if you have liked this video hit the like button do comment if you have any clarifications or you know you can encourage me by commenting on the type of teaching involved do subscribe and don't forget to share if you find this video useful thank you